Well, I want to I want to welcome everyone to the Iowa City Noon Rotary Club. It's great to see all your smiley faces today. I am Eric Weiler, your president this year. We start each of our meetings with the Pledge of Allegiance. So if everyone could please unmute yourself and we're gonna put the uh, slide of the American flag up momentarily. If everyone could please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance, pledge allegiance to the flag, to the flag of the United, United States, States of America, of America. And to, to the republic, republic for which, which it stands, one, one, one nation, nation under God, under God Indivisible, indivisible with liberty, liberty and justice for all. for all. Great, thank you. Now we're going to go over to Devin with Zoom tips. So, Devin? Yeah, thanks, President Eric. Do real fast. Uh, you can check out the chat for putting your name in for attendance and talking to your fellow Rotarians. It's better than whispering at the table or not, depending on if you like that sort of thing. Check out your view up in the top right corner, uh, or if on the on a phone you've got a little thing where it looks like a gallery or like a little movie thing, like a film thing that's for the speaker. And then when we get uh, to Gary's uh, presentation, definitely encourage you to look at speaker. And finally, if you go to the reactions tab, there's a whole bunch of emojis, including let's see, what do we got? Aha, we can do football. I'm sure there's basketball. There's scared face from Gary Pesha. <laughs> means we should probably stop talking. <laughs> and then finally, you have a raise hand option there. So if you have guests, visitors, questions, please use that so that we can get to you um, and see that you have a question and respond um, in whichever section of the meeting you're in. Back to you, President Eric. Great, thank you, David. We always love to recognize and welcome our guests each week. So if you're a Rotarian who has a guest, or if you're a visiting Rotarian, or if you somehow clicked on this and wonder where in the world am I, click raise hand and we'd like to recognize and welcome you. Any, no guests today? I do have a guest. Oh yes, yep, yep. <laughs> yep. Yes, and Amber I wanted to- Stieg. Yes, I wanted to welcome Brianna Perel, who is the Chief Operate, Operations Officer with Sigma Lambda Gamma National Sorority, Inc. And wanted to welcome her and allow her to say just a, a few words. Hi, everyone. I'm so happy no one got flown up to Wizard of Oz um, yesterday. And everybody's here, um, still on Earth in Iowa City. Um, but yes, I'm Brianna Perel. I am the uh, Chief Operations Officer of Sigma Lambda Gamma. Sigma Lambda Gamma is actually the largest multicultural sorority uh, in the nation. We were founded here at the University of Iowa in 1990. So SLG has um, really strong history and roots uh, here on campus. So I'm so excited to be here with you all and hear what's, what, what you all are cooking. Great. Thank welcome, you. Bri welcome, Brianna. We, uh, yeah, feel free to join us anytime. We meet every Thursday over the lunch hour. And we've been blessed uh, this fall, we've been able to induct several new members into our club. And this past Tuesday, we just had two more prospective members attend Rotary Orientation. And you'll be getting to meet them here in the next couple of weeks as well too. So just wanna encourage everyone to invite your, your friends or others in the community who you think would make great Rotarians, invite them to join us. Uh, with more people, we can do more great work in our community and around the world. So if you have an announcement, uh, please click raise hand. And I know uh, Linda Farkas, Linda, you told me you have an announcement for the group. I have some wonderful news. Uh, all of our teams have completed interviewing World Affairs students at City, West and Liberty. We've teamed up with our wonderful AM uh, Rotary Club and they've helped with the interviews. Um, we are going to pay for 26 World Affairs students. Um, and that's a lot because each co each costs $735 per student to send. And we are able to send it. Thank you to the donors. I, I, you're humble, you humble me, the people that continue to give so generously for these students to attend. Um, and I also want to thank my committee because while it looks pretty simple when I can just announce that we're going to send 26 students to World Affairs, there's a lot of work and the interviewers that come in to interview to do all the work. I'm gonna give a shout out to Nancy Pesha at the AM Club who works tirelessly at my side because without her, this would not happen. So um, thank you, 26 students. 
um, Madeline, I'll be asking for some money pretty soon and um, we will be um, moving on to Ryla probably in January. We'll take a little breather here and then move on to Ryla. So thank you to everyone on this call who has contributed, who has helped work. Thank you. Great, thank you, Linda. And uh, Joe Hughes, Joe, you have an announcement? Yeah, thanks, President Eric. Uh, uh, thanks to everyone who rang the uh, bell for the Salvation Army this uh, last Friday at Fairway in Iowa City. Uh, we have two more spots that we're looking to fill uh, for this Saturday at the Coralville Walmart, either 1.15 or 2.15 p.m. And I tell you what, uh, if, if someone signs up for one of the spots, I'll take my kids and do the other spot. So uh, then we will have fulfilled our obligation. So thanks to everyone who's done it. And if you have pictures, send them to me. I'd love to see them. Thanks. Great. And thank you, Joe, for helping to lead this effort for us. I just had a couple of quick announcements. I uh, want to encourage everyone, make sure you uh, watch for my email every Monday morning. Uh, communication is really important to me. So every Monday morning, I'm emailing all of our Rotarians information about our upcoming programs, who the speakers are, and ways to get, it, get involved in the community, such as the Salvation Army bell ringing. So it's a great way to learn what's going on with your Rotary Club. Also wanted to mention, um, one of the favorite parts of the meeting for me in the last year was the Rotary moment of uh, positivity and gratitude, where one of our members would share two to three minutes about something positive in their life, in their world, in their career. And I know a lot of you have done the Rotary moment already, but if you have yet to do a Rotary moment and would like to do one in the coming future, uh, reach out and let me know. We'd love to get you on the calendar and we'd love to get that back as part of our meeting as well too. And final announcement I had, um, we were uh, sad to learn this week that uh, Rotarian Bill Stanford, Bill's wife Marlene passed away last week and wanted to uh, express our prayers and thoughts to, to Bill and his family for the loss of Marlene. Uh, Linsing Funeral Home is caring for the family and handling the service. So you can go to Linsing Funeral Home to find information more about the obituary and the service. So with that, um, if you could please join me, I think we need to take a, just a, a moment of uh, silence in memory of uh, Bill Stanford's wife, Marlene. So if you please join me in a moment of silence. Great, thank you. Any other announcements for the good of the club at all? With that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, one of our past presidents, Jim Connor. Jim is going to introduce our speaker to us today. Jim. Great. Thanks, Eric. Uh, Gary Barda is in his 16th year as director of athletics at the University of Iowa. The University of Iowa Department of Intercollegiate Athletics employs more than 250 full-time staff who work to provide more than 650 male and female student athletes a superior academic and athletics experience. Gary's involvement in the UI campus and the greater Iowa City community extends beyond his position as UI's AD. A couple of noteworthy examples are his involvement in the president's cabinet, comprised of vice presidents and other campus leaders who provide counsel to the UI's president, and his leadership of the college football playoff selection committee, where he served as chair in 2021 for a second consecutive year. From a local community standpoint, Gary has been a regular participant in numerous chamber and convention and visitors bureau initiatives during his tenure. He is a long-standing member of the UI Partnership for Alcohol Safety Committee and participated for several years on the United Way of Johnson and Washington County's board of directors, including a term as board chair. Gary earned a bachelor of science degree in mass communications and broadcast journalism for North Dakota State in 1987 he was an option quarterback for the Bison football teams that won the Division II NCAA National Championships in 1983, 1985, and 1986. Gary and his wife, Connie, have a son, Luke, and a daughter, Madison. Please help me welcome Gary Barda to our Rotary meeting. And Gary, thank you for joining us. Thank you. It's great to see everybody. And, and Jim, um, you know, I would when you read that, I, I think about 16 years and I look at the screen and uh, not every one of you, but so many of you uh, I've had the pleasure of getting to know, to work with, to serve with. 
And uh, I thank you for what you're doing in Rotary, because I know, you know, when I listen to the different outreaches, the different uh, organizations, we, we live in a great community. And I think it's easy to take that for granted. And I know it doesn't just happen. You know, I see Mayor Teague, I see volunteers, I see uh, people that, uh, you know, whether it's United Way or Red Cross or et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so thank you. Thanks for uh, doing your part to make this a great community because it is an awesome community. It's been a, since I've been here 16 years, my kids were real young when we moved here. And I'm, I'm the first to tell people that this is a great place to raise a family. It, it's not a good place. It's a great place between education and opportunity and, and medicine and uh, obviously the arts and athletics. Um, just, I just couldn't imagine a better place to raise a family. So uh, it's great to be with you again. I look forward to the day where we can be together in person, um, as, as I know we all have. And, and we, you know, we survived. Uh, hopefully everybody got through. I heard earlier last night, I woke up in the middle of the night and I think I heard some of those 70 mile an hour winds um, and looked outside and was glad to see that the house uh, didn't get blown away. And, um, but it's, uh, you know, we've, we've survived a lot of things and, and, and we're still going through the pandemic. And so, uh, you know, as we, as we work through that, you know, you know, just uh, one of the things we talk to our student athletes about is, and I talk to my family about, and I remind myself, life uh, never was meant to be easy, simple, or without roadblocks and, or challenges. So we, uh, we went through one last night. Uh, we're going through one in the pandemic, whatever it is, the economy, um, you, just, you just keep fighting through. through. And, and I really, um, I bring that up because last year uh, and, and this past year and a half or almost two years now, our student athletes and our coaches have, have done amazing things through the pandemic. I think I spoke to this group a while back and you know, talked about how our student athletes pretty much gave up their personal lives uh, you know, when they were in quarantine almost or in isolation and, and preparing and competing, uh, they had to test every single day. Uh, we spent about six million dollars uh, during the height of the pandemic in uh, in testing our student athletes and our staff and our coaches. Um, and and they did an amazing job through all that through all that adversity. We called it the year of champions. They won five Big Ten championships and we had. Uh, the national players of the year with Luca and, and uh, Spencer Lee and, and Caitlin. And uh, we had, we had a road scholar. I mean uh, you know, that, that doesn't happen very often. So all those things just prove that when we go through adversity in our lives, whatever it is uh, you, you can do it, you can fight through it and you can come out the other end. So that's been an amazing thing for me to watch and it's, and to watch our community uh, work through it as well. It was awesome to see Kinnick Stadium full again, because it was not so awesome the year before when uh, we played in front of nobody. Um, I shouldn't say that. Our families were there. The student athletes' families were there. They weren't nobodies, but we played in, front, in, in Kinnick Stadium in front of about 400, 500 people. It's not quite the same uh, as it was uh, this fall. And, and you know, speaking of this fall, uh, you know, our, our field hockey team ended up uh, winning the Big Ten regular season championship. They went to the Elite Eight, uh, had an amazing run with that team. Football, uh, you know, 10 wins so far. Um, and, and there's only been 10 teams in the history of Iowa football that have won 10 games. And we have another one. We get to play Kentucky in the bowl. And uh, should we win that one, there's only been five teams in the history of Iowa football who have won 11 games. So uh, we're very excited about that opportunity, um, trying to heal up a little bit. The students are going through finals this week, so it's a pretty light practice week. In fact, they don't have any uh, organized practice, just some walkthroughs while they go through finals, <clears throat> and then they'll get, back, uh, they'll get back into it. And, you know, we, we have those trophy games, so it was a, a rewarding year that way. We beat Nebraska. We beat uh, Minnesota. We beat that team in the middle of the state. I know there are some Iowa State fans on the – on the call. So that's okay. Uh, but this year we happened to beat them. Uh, we've happened to beat them several years in a row. I think I, I may have uh, lost track at some point, but I say that in good fun. Um, so, so it was a, it was a really great fall so far. Our women's soccer team had a, had a terrific season 
And now we, we move into the winter and uh, wrestling is ranked number one in the country. And for the first time since I've been here, we sold out in season tickets. That's amazing. When I tell people that around the country, they, they, they can't fathom that. They can't imagine, you know, having 15,000 people or 12,000 people at a wrestling match. Uh, so, so we're looking forward to that. Men's basketball, very exciting team to watch. We have Grandpa Bohannon. Uh, Jordan's in his uh, like 27th year, I think. I say with a smile on my face. And then, you know, some younger players, um, you know, with, with Keegan and Chris Murray and then the, the McCaffrey brothers. And, uh, you know, we, we hit a tough stretch against some really good teams. We have some injuries, but, uh, you know, I'm confident that, um, that they're going to continue to improve. They play again this Saturday over in Sioux, uh, Sioux Falls. And then Lisa's team, Lisa got her, her 800th win and, uh, Caitlin Clark, uh, and Monica is just a, it's such a fun team to watch. They actually went through, I think most people know, they went through a, a stretch where we had COVID positives and we had to shut that team down for, uh, we, we had to uh, cancel three basketball games, women's basketball games. And so that, that is still, we're still kind of catching up because they couldn't practice uh, for about 10 days. And so, you know, we're back at it and everybody's fine and there were no serious illnesses, uh, but we had to shut down uh, during that period. But the winter sports are up and running. Uh, Lisa's team plays this Saturday uh, in Carver Hawkeye Arena against Central Florida. So uh, here we go. So, so those are some, some really exciting things happening. Um, you know, as I, as I look at some other things going on in, in college sports, uh, we signed, uh, we had signing day in football yesterday, and we, and we had signing days earlier in some other sports uh, this winter. And, and it's really a fascinating time in college athletics. And some of the fascination is, is good. And some of it uh, concerns me about the core of, of, uh, of college athletics. Overall, uh, what we do still is the same as when I started doing this about 35 years ago. You know, we have a, we have a great opportunity for student athletes to come in, earn a degree from a great university and, and play sports at the highest level. But we have name, image, and likeness now that's, um, that we have to figure out how to, how to manage. Both student athletes have to figure it out and uh, coaches and, and administrators and businesses. So we're working through that. It's new. Uh, the transfer portal, that's something that uh, is really fascinating. Again, uh, some of it good because now student athletes have the freedom uh, to move from one school to another. But then some of it, again, is a learning experience. I think I heard uh, last week, I may not have the exact number, but to give you a sense, last week uh, on, on about midweek, there were over 2,000 football players in the transfer portal. And, and the reason that's, that's fascinating and concerning at the same time, I can assure you there aren't 2,000 scholarships available uh, for those 2,000 uh, students who are, who are trying to find a new home. And so one of the things that we're all going to have to learn through this, the student athletes and, um, and, and the coaches and the staffs is, you know, how is this going to work? And, and, you know, is the grass always greener? And, and when do I, when do I, you know, it used to be you stuck with it that freshman year. And, and I, I hope some of you can remember your freshman year in college. For some of us, it was longer ago than for others. Uh, that first year is the most difficult year, whether you're a student athlete or, or just a student and not an athlete. Uh, that first year can be a, a big change. And, you know, one of my concerns is that that first year, uh, it's not going perfectly. And so I just decide to go somewhere else. And, you know, once you go, there's, you know, there's no turning back. So again, that's, that's all, it, not, not all of that is a bad thing. I, I do support the student to have full choice. I just, I think there's going to take some time for us to get used to uh, you know, how, how often or, or uh, when someone should make that decision to transfer and what their reasons are. And hopefully they aren't doing it too soon. So again, just change uh, in name, image, and likeness, change in, uh, in transfers. Another change is conference realignment. Uh, the Big Ten, knock on wood, is, uh, is staying uh, as is. But uh, the, the announcement this fall that Texas and Oklahoma were going to leave the Big 12 and go to the SEC, and then that that created a cascade of of other changes. And so, uh, you know, that's interesting to watch. 
At the end of the day, what we're going to stay focused on at Iowa is our value statement. As you all know, when you have strategic plans and, and we have one and we follow it, it, that the plan can change over time and does. The goals can change over time and they do. But, but your value statement should, should remain the same no matter what the changes are. And in our case, we simplify that. Win, graduate, and do it right. And so wherever all of these changes take us, we'll, we'll work hard to navigate them and, and remain true to our values. And that's to earn a degree, to win every time we step out that we can, and, and in both of those cases, do it the right way. So that's kind of a, you know, some things going on uh, nationally. Uh, I did have the pleasure and the opportunity to serve on the, the uh, college football playoff committee. It was, uh, it, in, you know, I've served on a lot of committees in college athletics over the years. And uh, this one is, is, you know, seen by many, and I, I would be on that list to be the most prestigious and, and the biggest honor. So to be uh, offered the opportunity to do that, uh, to represent the University of Iowa uh, and, and to, to serve, I was, <clears throat> I was sitting there watching the games the other day with my committee and on one side of me was an NFL Hall of Famer in Will Shields. On the other side of me is a longtime Power Five uh, coach, Tyrone Willingham. And I'm watching these games and we're going through our process. I'm thinking, wow, this is, uh, this is pretty special. Some of you know uh, my family. Uh, this was, uh, I, I was away from my family uh, every week from Sunday until Wednesday. And uh, those of you who know my wife might think that she said, well, you know, that that was uh, kind of nice for that that time away. But she's welcomed me back into the home. So that's good. And uh, and I had the um, the one thing I didn't like about the position is that I had to go on ESPN and speak on behalf of 13 members of the committee, whether I agreed with the decisions or not. And I I got uh, I already have in my current my day job. I They didn't care for me either. So I just added to, to that list. But it, it, again, in all seriousness, it was an honor to do that. Uh, big news. Back in November, we announced the addition of women's wrestling and uh, hired our coach, Clarissa Chun. And uh, she's, a, she's an amazing coach. She starts in February. She wanted to finish up uh, her, her, um, her stint with the USA wrestling team. And uh, so we, we agreed to that when we hired her. We're going to go through this process of recruiting some student athletes this year. She'll fill out her staff. Uh, and this fall, we'll have student athletes on campus, but they'll be competing uh, unattached, which we do on the men's side as well. And then in the fall of 2023, that'll be our first year of competing um, at, as Iowa Hawkeyes. And uh, we've been looking at that possibility now for several years. We weren't necessarily ready uh, to, to launch yet. But uh, with everything related to COVID, and, and I think it was well documented, I know it was well documented, we had our financial issues, and then we cut some sports, and we were going through, we brought women's swimming back, and we added women's wrestling uh, to, to round out and, and, um, and move forward. Again, we were planning to do it, we just did it sooner, and fortunately, we had some donors step up that are going to fund uh, the, the first several years of that, uh, of that effort. So... Wow, lots of change throughout the, the pandemic. Uh, I know all of you went through and are going through it in your businesses, in your home life, but we will get through it. And uh, we can have a year of champions in our life, just like, uh, just like the Hawkeyes did. So I mentioned it was an honor to serve on the CFP, but more importantly, it's been an honor for my family and I, my wife, Connie, and my son, <laughs> Luke, and my daughter, Maddie, who are both, uh, my son just finished uh, uh, his last class at Iowa. So he'll walk out with a degree, as far as I know. And then my daughter has one more year, and she's going to be student teaching next fall. And so it's been an honor for us to, uh, for me to be in this job for the last 16 years and for our family to live in the community. And with that, uh, I don't think I went 25 minutes, and, but I'm happy to, to answer any questions within reason. And if it's not within reason, I'll, I'll just say uh, pass. <laughs> I'm just kidding. So if, if anyone has a question for Gary, please click raise hand and we'll call on you. I see uh, Mike Carberry. Mike, you have your hand raised. Yes, thank you. And uh, 
Gary, it's so nice to have you on here. And Thanks, Mike. Uh, my question rega regarding, uh, you know, as a season ticket holder of football, basketball, and wrestling, and uh, attending a lot of other games, I've been a Hawkeye fan all my life. And uh, but thank you for your service to the college football playoff as chair. I know that's not an easy job, but uh, I'm interested in expansion of the CFP playoffs. We're currently at four teams, and I think the optimal number is eight with five power five conferences getting automatic bids and then three wild cards. Did you guys talk about that at all? And the expansion, I know there's been a proposal out there for 12. I like eight. Some people say 16. Can you uh, talk about that a bit? Thank you. Yeah, uh, the commissioners are the ones who ultimately will make that decision. They make up the management committee of the CFP. And so uh, you're right. There was a, a, a study done and this summer uh, 12 was certainly brought forward as a, as a desired uh, model. But to, your, to answer your question, yes, eight is being discussed and has been discussed. Um, a excuse me, a decision has not been made yet. And so there are still four years left with the current agreement. The question is, if we go to eight or we go to 12, will we do it uh, before those four years are up? And that's really what's being debated. So I don't really have a strong uh, lean toward 12 or eight. I am supportive of expansion. It would, it would allow more teams to get in. Uh, the question is, are, the, are those games going to be played at home sites? Are they going to be pay, played on bowl uh, locations? And so all of that is the reason it's taking a while is because there is a current contract. So those contracts have to be honored. And then uh, the, the decision whether to go to eight to 12. So I, I don't have any, I can't give you any insight. There's a lot of momentum for 12, but eight is being discussed. And I'm, I'm pretty sure it will expand. Uh, just whether it'll be eight or 12 is yet to be determined. Great. Joe Hughes, you have a question, Joe? Yeah, thanks, President Eric. Um, Gary, we're very excited about uh, women's wrestling. Uh, what uh, efforts have you been making to recruit other Division I programs, um, and what are the prospects looking like for that? There are, uh, there are at least three that I'm, um, I'm hearing and pretty uh, confident at some point will be announcing. Uh, I, you know, Iowa, again, we weren't necessarily ready at this time, but we were planning to do it in the next few years. I love the idea that we're first and the fact that, you know, because of our history, because of our tradition, because we already have 600 girls, high school girls in the state of Iowa who wrestle. Uh, and it just made, it, it was, it was just, everything came together and it made sense. I, I can't say which schools uh, are, are close to making the announcement, uh, but I can tell you that uh, there, there are a few. And once, I think once that happens, uh, one, it's a great sport if you have a tradition of wrestling at your school. The other is in order to be in compliance with Title IX, you know, there, there's a trend across the country that the female enrollment on campuses is increasing. And, or, and, and so the spread between male and female enrollment is changing across the country, not just at Iowa. And if that trend continues, one of the, one of the uh, parameters of being in compliance at Title IX is having the same, the, the same types of percentages with your student athletes as the general student body. And so uh, that's something that, that could uh, push a few people uh, more to do it. But again, it makes most sense if you currently have a good tradition in men's wrestling. So I can't say who's, uh, I, I can't acknowledge or say who is looking at it. Plus we're recording this. Um, but, uh, but there are some that I think are really close. And I'm glad Ryan Bell, you have a question. Sorry. Uh, yeah. Thanks for being here today, Gary. This is really good. Um, I'm just curious with the name image uh, likeness, you know, money that players can now collect does that bring on any more oversight for your office like do you have to sort of sign off on uh you know them doing a commercial or or taking an endorsement of some sort yeah to some degree uh it, it does take on a little bit more oversight it's not uh, whether or not we approve or disapprove it's making sure that it's compliant um and and for example you know if a student athlete wants to use the tiger hawk logo in a commercial you know, there's a process by which you have to go to get that approved. And, and so it's just, 
it, it's a process like everything else, but we're not in the business of saying you can do it or you can't do it. Uh, that's up to the student athlete and their family, uh, unless you use our logo and then we have say, because it's our, it's our image and likeness, it's our licensed uh, logo. And then we wanna make sure, you know, I'll use this example because they are one of our corporate sponsors, but hy V is if they do uh, uh, work with a student athlete, um, and then, then they use our logo. And as long as we approve the use of it, uh, it's, all, it's all approved. So there is a little bit of oversight there, yes. Um, most importantly is educating our students. Uh, you know, it's the old adage, be careful that if a deal looks too good to be true, uh, it might be, and make sure you're having uh, someone other than yourself maybe look at the agreement before you sign it, especially if you're signing a contract. Uh, just make sure that what you're agreeing to is is not more than you know than you know. Th there are there have been some of these NIL agreements where the student athlete has signed off, and unbeknownst to them, they've signed off on an agreement that that gives away their rights for a five year period. And if they go into you know pro sports or they go into another business. They've signed away their rights for you know multiple years. So I'm not aware that we have any students at Iowa that have done that, but I am aware of that happening. So we just we're trying to educate uh, when you you know when you make business decisions that that you make them uh, carefully, and then also the tax understanding. If if you get a check for a thousand dollars and taxes aren't taken out of that, uh, just remember at some point they will be. And so you know there's stories. Uh, Ohio State had a football player who received a, a $70,000 vehicle. That's wonderful. But did they provide him the, the tax money to pay the taxes on that $70,000 bill? Or did he think of that? I don't know if he did or he didn't. But those are the types of things that are just going to be new in, in name, image, and likeness. Um, and, and we're doing everything we can to educate our students about making good choices. Thank you. Gary, I was going to ask, um, we, we read and we see in our country, unfortunately, mental health issues are on the rise and student athletes have a lot of weight on their shoulders they're carrying. Can you talk about some of the mental health resources you have to provide for students if they need help? Yes. Uh, it, it's, as you've mentioned, it's a societal issue. Uh, it's an issue on our campus with all students, uh, probably faculty and staff as well. Uh, but to answer your question, when I first got here, uh, our student athletes could use the, the general university um, mental health uh, professional, and they still can. Uh, many years ago, maybe 10 years ago, we hired our first uh, staff psychologist in athletics. We now have uh, between full-time and, and uh, hired consultants, we have five staff members, and we're about to add a sixth working with our student athletes. Um, on two levels. One, I mean, there, there are multiple levels. There's an eating disorder uh, specialist that, that we have on hand. There's, uh, you know, certainly there's, there's uh, uh, daily mental health, there's performance mental health, uh, and then there's the serious, uh, you know, the serious all the way to, uh, you know, contemplating suicide and like, like not just student athletes, but like all students. So we have uh, significant resources dedicated toward it. And I still feel like in our society, there's, there's just still not enough. So just trying, all of us learning how to cope. How do we cope with COVID? How do we cope with the stresses of, of our job? How do we cope with relationships uh, and, and all the things that we cope with? And that's sort of what I was alluding to earlier. We all can get through this. I love the, the one of your um, opening about, uh, you know, having positivity uh, stories told. Uh, because we need more of that in our day-to-day -day lives. There's a lot of positive there, but sometimes we focus on the negative. I kind of got off track there, but I hope I answered your question. Yep. Any other questions for Gary? I'll, I'll ask one more, Gary. I know um, when student athletes graduate and they become alumni, I know there's the varsity club and some other opportunities, but what are some ways that you engage the student athletes once they become alumni? Well, we have the, the uh, it, it was called the Varsity Club. It's now called the Iowa Letter Winners Club. Okay. Uh, many years ago, it was just for men. A uh, long time ago, uh, it, you know, it, it rightfully so included both men and women. And so we have reunions uh, mm -hmm. with teams, whether it's 10-year or 20-year or championship reunions. 
Uh, we have annual, uh, you know, we have the Hall of Fame every year. Mm -hmm. We invite letter winners back. We have a letter winners advisory group where two members uh, from each sport uh, work with our department. And, and uh, you know, we use them as a great resource to talk about how to better engage with our student athletes. We have a, a software um, uh, arrangement, and I wish I remembered the name of it, but I don't, that, that engages our former student athletes. Mm -hmm. So um, we do everything we can, including ask them for money, uh, yep. you know, asking them to give back to their sport. And uh, so it's, it's uh, just an ongoing effort. Clearly, when someone leaves this program, we hope that they had such a great experience that they want to stay engaged. And many or most of them do. And then for me, it's the home run when they start sending their kids uh, to become mm -hmm. student athletes at Iowa. Then we know uh, we, we had a, you know, we had a great experience between the student athlete and, and the university. Yeah, great. Barb Thomas, Barb, you have a question? Uh, I do. Gary, thanks so much for being here. Um, I am wondering specifically about the transfer portal. Could you talk about how the transfer portal is affecting Iowa sports? Well, uh, it, it affects us in that uh, students can choose to go into the portal and leave, and it affects us in that students can come from somewhere else into the portal and arrive at Iowa. And we've had both. Um, we've experienced both. I would say that uh, our number of transfers is relatively low compared to some of our peers. I'm, you know, I'm hearing anecdotally from different schools that are having higher numbers. Um, we don't bring in a lot of transfers and we don't have a, a, a large number that transfer out. Um, we, I, I don't think we're ever going to become, there are some universities who are using that as their primary recruiting tool now. Instead of primarily looking at high school seniors, some of them are, are trying to get, get good quick, uh, get well quick through the transfer portal. And, you know, one of our, I think one of the things that makes Iowa successful is we look for the long play. We look for longevity. You look at our coaches, whether it's Kirk or Lisa, uh, Tom Brands. I mean, you look across the board with our coaches and, and many of them have been here a long, long time. Part of that is because we're trying to create a foundation that, that withstands the test of time. Well, that's the same in recruiting. There might be a reason if people are going into a transfer portal, maybe it's just because it wasn't working, but sometimes it, it's because there were some issues. So you just have to be thoughtful. You have to do your homework. And you know when you bring someone in to, your camp, to our campus from the transfer portal, you wanna make sure they fit our culture, just like you try to do when you recruit uh, a freshman or a, a senior out of high school. So it, th there's nothing magic about the transfer portal other than it, it does give students more flexibility to move between schools. And, and we're all learning. You know, uh, I'm sure some of our students would say they made a mistake from transferring. Um, some, of, some of the students we've brought here maybe haven't worked out, but for the most part, I think it's, it's working the way it was intended. Great, thank you. Yeah. And Gary, we also had a question in the chat. Uh, how is the name, image, and likeness impacting recruiting? Well, I think this, the class we signed yesterday, I've heard several of them immediately contacted our office and said, how do I, how do I comply with the name, image, and likeness process at Iowa? So there's interest in it. Um, I'm hearing stories, and maybe some of you have heard the stories. There's, there's one national story about a student athlete who had committed a football player who had committed to Florida State. And uh, he, he switched at the last minute yesterday and announced that he was going to one of the historically black uh, colleges. And it's, it's at least the stories being told that he switched because of a $3 million name, image, and likeness offer. I don't know if that's true or not, but you know, that's an example of a large example. If that becomes, it's not supposed to be a recruiting tool. If it does start to become a recruiting tool, that's going to be outside of what it was intended. What it was intended to do is a student athlete having the opportunity to earn money off their name, as the name says, off their name, image, and likeness while they're a student athlete, rather than being an employee of the university. Uh, I, I worry that it is going to be used as a recruiting tool, and, and uh, that's not what it was intended for. So I don't, it, we haven't seen it uh, on a large scale yet at Iowa. Um, but you know, who knows it's, it's brand new. 
Oh, great. And Gary, just one final question. Uh, how has the Extreme Arena been working out for the volleyball program? I know that's their, their home venue, if you will. Well, first of all, it's a great arena, a great addition to our community. I've had a chance to see some other events there, a concert there. Um, really excited about it. Uh, we were excited about getting volleyball in there. COVID, you know, obviously when we competed in there and there was only, you know, 50 uh, fans and then, and then we didn't have the success we wanted this year. I, I believe it's going to work real well. There, there were some, as we expected, there were some bumps in terms of converting, you know, trying to, it's a hockey arena, it's a volleyball uh, court and just trying to work through all that. But uh, the city has been great in working with us. And I still think the size is going to be perfect and uh, the venue is great. So I'm still excited about uh, that becoming a, a really a, a home court advantage, because I think if you have 2000 people in there, uh, I know it can be really loud. Great. Well, Gary, uh, thank you so much for your time today. And thank you for your leadership of the University of Iowa Athletics. Uh, Gary, in honor of our speakers every week, we make a donation to Rotary's Polio Plus program. Eradicating polio has been an initiative of Rotary for decades. And our donation is matched two to one by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And that'll result, Gary, in 70 polio vaccinations in your honor around the world. So uh, thank you again. Oh, thank you. And again, thanks all of you for serving our community in your various ways and go Hawks. Great. Uh, final reminders, uh, no Rotary meeting next week. We'll be celebrating uh, Christmas with, uh, with family and friends. So I hope everyone has a great holiday. We will return the following Thursday on December 30th. We're gonna have a real fun meeting that will be hosted by our own members. We're gonna talk about great things that have happened this year and prospects for the new year. And we're gonna do a small breakout room. So it should be a lot of fun. So make sure you join us on December 30th. If you're, uh, if you're at your in-laws or cousins, just go in a spare bedroom, pop on your phone or your laptop. We'd love to have you join us. And we like to conclude every Rotary meeting with the four-way test. So we'll put the four-way test slide up here in one second. And if everyone could please unmute and join me in Rotary's four-way test of the things we think, think say, or do. Or do. Is, it is it the truth? truth? Is it fair, is to, it fair all to all concerned? concerned? Will it build, build goodwill, goodwill and better, better friendships? Will be beneficial, beneficial to all concerned? concerned. Hope everyone has a wonderful Christmas and uh, we'll see you on December 30th. So thank you guys. Bye.